Alright, so I decided to do something a little bit different for this video. Now, as you may notice, the intro isn't in this video. And well, that's because every time I use the intro, I get a copyright ID claim. Now, you may hear this and be confused because the videos are still up with the intro in it. And that's because an ID claim is very different from, like, a copyright strike. I'm going to risk getting a copyright strike on any of my videos due to the fact that I know that there are people who try to false flag my content, and it does successfully work on occasion. Best example I could think of would be part two of my January 6th anime opening. Now you may hear that and immediately jump to the conclusion that the video was taken down manually by YouTube and not by anyone who would theoretically false flag my content. But the weird thing about it is that there are so much worse content that's allowed on YouTube. There is a part of me that believes that a good majority of content that does get taken down on YouTube is mostly an effort from a community of people who like to flag down people's content. We're at Kiwi Farms. And before anyone goes to the whole Smash Bandicoot thing where like, oh, well, Kiwi Farms went after that person for flagging down people's content. And while that may be true, at the same time, the people who were being flagged down by Smash Bandicoot were huge YouTubers. And I don't think Kiwi Farms wants another UTTP situation on their hands, because that was during the time the UTTP was being completely destroyed. And another thing too, there is probably someone watching this video, assuming that I'm talking about them, when in reference to the January 6th Part 2 anime opening. And while yes, that person was the first person I accused of doing that, at the same time, given further evidence, I'm led to believe that it was someone else. And let's not forget that King Cobra JFS got his channel struck twice for extremely stupid reasons. The first time, it was for a Talking Tom related video, which was just him using the app, right? And the second time, it was because he was defending Israel. Both of these situations, you could tell, were manufactured by the people going after him. With the whole Talking Tom related thing, that video was so tame that it's been re-uploaded a couple of times by other people with little to no consequences. And with the whole Israel thing, well, I'd be more confused than anything if YouTube didn't support Israel, mainly because big corporations all over America support Israel. Really, the only people I could think of who don't support Israel would be extreme leftists or neo-Nazis. With that being said, is it any wonder that such innocent content from King Cobra JFS would be taken down simply just because of the fact that people are flagging his content? As someone who dealt with this myself, it's kind of not too hard to believe that there are people out there who do that type of stuff just because they want someone off the internet or what have you. But this isn't what you came here to listen to. No. You came here to listen to me talk about the beach. And in a way, while yes, this is a video about my childhood, at the same time, I will also be talking about some stuff that happened, well, later in life. So, yeah. And one more thing before we start. Yes, this video is titled very vaguely, but that's because this is not just my personal physical experience with the beach, but this is also my experience with beach-like aesthetics, so keep that in mind. One of my earliest memories I've had involving the beach would be this one time where we had like a luau. I don't know if it was one time or multiple times, but like, it was like a type of like Hawaiian type luau type of thing, right? And when I was there, I remember there was, like, a whole entire pig 
being like used for like I, I I guess to eat I guess right and I remember seeing that and I just thought back to like the scene from Shrek two or maybe when I saw Shrek two I looked back at that moment in my life I I don't know but regardless both times where like you know I saw Shrek two for the first time and I was at that luau. We were very close to each other in terms of, like, happening within my life. I also remember going on a lot of cruises as well. And, like, with those, I feel like I had, like, more fun on the actual boat than I did when I actually, like, got to the destination itself. You know what I mean? few times I did end up going on cruises would be with... One time where we went on a cruise to Mexico, which, yeah, it was in, like, the one of the more tourist spots, obviously. It, like, you know, around the beach area. And admittedly, it was pretty nice to explore. However, the weird thing about exploring Mexico when I was a kid was that my parents, when I was there, right, they were just standing there doing nothing the entire time, right? And then, for no reason whatsoever, they just randomly vanished out of nowhere. And so what ended up happening was that I just went around looking for them, right? And lo and behold, there they were. Except when I found them, it was in an extremely awkward situation. Mainly because my mom thought it would be a good idea to sneak up behind me and scare me when... I was, like, wandering around the streets of Mexico, right? And, like, in all honesty, I, I thought I was being abducted at that moment. Which honestly freaked me out for a long time. Another thing that I remember is that on another cruise that I went on, I ended up going to Jamaica, right? And with that one... It was a little bit more of a pleasant experience than the Mexico one. I mean, I did end up meeting some new friends who I've only ever talked to while on that trip. And the thing about it is, is that, you know, I still have the pictures saved from that experience. And no, unfortunately, I don't think I'll be able to show you any of them in this video. But the thing about it is, is that, it's such a shame to really think about how much, like, I've met so many people and lost contact with almost all of them, except for, like, a select few. And another thing to really keep in mind is that while I was in Jamaica, that person I met never saw again. And I bet you now they're, like, around the same age as me as I speak, right? And it's so weird to think that, like, you know, that person probably doesn't remember my existence at all, but I do. I mean, I don't remember much about them, mainly because all I have to really keep in my memory about that person was that, well, they exist, mainly because I have pictures of them, you, you know what I mean? Not, like, of them, but, like, of me and them, y you know what I mean? What was also kind of strange is, is that while I was there, my parents and I just randomly walked into a video game shop, right? And didn't buy anything, which was honestly kind of saddening to me, mainly because I saw a copy of New Super Mario Bros. Wii on the shelf, right? And I wanted it so bad. Like... I never really got the chance to actually own a physical copy of that game, but I have played it, whether it be through rentals or emulation or whatever. I still managed to get my hands on that game, and when I played it, I loved it. So, yeah. And before you ask anything about what that has to do with the beach, for one, I did stumble upon it in a tropical area, and... For two, New Super Mario Brothers Wii does have a beach level, so yeah, make of that as what you will. There was another place I remember going to that I had a lot of fun with, and no, this wasn't on a cruise, but like, 
what this was was that like it was like kind of like a city boardwalk type of thing but like while it was that yes at the same time it was kind of like still a beach at the end of the day it had you know an ocean it had sand but it also had an, a little area that you could walk around and like buy stuff at and like that area that i remember like i remember like it's always at these beach areas that you always see the coolest shirts you know what i mean like of stuff that you'd never see anywhere else and i kind of like that but one thing i'll always remember about this specific vacation that i went on was when i was in the hotel room and i watched jojo's bizarre adventure on the tv specifically stardust crusaders because that was the part i was on while i was you know binging the show at the time and i gotta admit it's really cool to see a lot of the locations on stardust crusaders while you know being at the beach you know like i think the best one i could think of is when the gang went to singapore right like with that one like I don't know, there was something really personal about that that just felt something to me, you know? Like, I remember watching that, I think, while I was there. I mean, I did also watch the episode where, like, you know, they were playing poker as well. But, like, it's specifically the episode in Singapore where, like, Polnareff is, like, fighting against the little, the little doll, right? Like, that one, I feel like... It just has something to it. And, like, I honestly think the only way I could properly describe this type of thing is to call it a beach aesthetic. And a lot of pieces of media have that, right? But there are also a lot of pieces of media that have night-based aesthetics, too. But when you combine the beach aesthetic with the night aesthetic, oh, boy, you get something fantastic and that is something seen in a lot of japanese media like jojo's bizarre adventure you know for example mainly because i'm talking about it now there are other times i went to the beach before talking about this uh last uh, vacation i went on you know the one that i was just talking about and you know like with these i think like they're very important to cherish in my mind mainly because of the fact that these were the first two ever conventions I've went to, and they were on the beach. And it's pretty interesting to really think about, because, like, I remember, like, seeing all those, those cosplayers, right, and how they, like, you know, wore those, like, different costumes, like, it felt like I was at Disney World. Like, when I took a picture with a cosplayer, at a convention when I was at that age, like, it just felt like I was taking a picture with the actual characters themselves. Nowadays, it doesn't feel like that anymore, especially when in my last time I went to a convention, I was cosplaying. But, like, to really think about this like that just puts a smile on my face, because it just, it just shows, like, a sense of childlike innocence in my mind that I had back then. Yeah, I still have a little bit of that to this day, but with a sense of, you know, maturity to it. And a lot of people who are watching this may hear that and scoff at the idea of me being mature in any way, shape, or form. But there are some things that I think about that do put into perspective where we are as a society, because, like, there are a lot of people who are, like, overly focused on, like, politics and stuff like that. Well, me, I just think that the world could be a better place if we, you know, do things together as a species, mainly because I've always thought to myself, it doesn't really matter who's in office, but more so what we do with the knowledge of who's in office. Because, like, I remember when Obama was president, everyone was at peace with each other. Like, mm, sure, maybe not in other countries, but in America, yeah. But I'm getting off track. I want to look back at the time while I was at my first ever convention when 
yes, I did meet a couple of voice actors while I was there. I met the the girl who voiced Amethyst from Steven Universe. And I also met Charles Martinet, the guy who voiced Mario. Actually, now that I think about it, I met him like twice, actually. First time would be at my first ever convention. Second time would be at my second. So really make of that as what you will. Looking back on the Steven Universe one, though, like, the girl who voiced Amethyst, like, while I was in line waiting to, you know, actually meet her for the first time, like, I was seeing, like, how she was, like, getting into character for everyone, and, like, she was, like, directly next to the girl who voiced Pearl, right? And they were, like, doing, like, a sort of imp improv type thing, and it was fun to watch. And, like, I felt so weird, like after the whole thing was said and over with like not immediately like while i was there but like years later because like you know i did get into my phase when i started thinking oh steven universe sucks right and then like what ended up happening eventually is that i started to actually like the show again i mean yeah i will admit the show did see a horrible seasonal decline near the end but, like, during the first few bits of the show, like, it was actually really, really good. Now, here's the thing. Something that I would love to talk about would be two cosplayers in particular that I met at this convention, right? One of which was, well, okay, this isn't really one, but it's, like, three people who are, like, dressed up as, like, a group of characters. But, like, you know, they, they, were, they were dressed up as a... Uh, you know, Yakko, Wacko, and Dot, you know, from the Animaniacs, and, like, they were really, really good, like, it was almost like if the characters just jumped out of the screen and came to life, and, like, I remember I was, like, a, a really dumb kid back then, right, and, like, I told them, hey, I'm cool, I'm a hipster, not knowing what that means, and then they just promptly started to make, like, wordplay jokes out of, like, the whole hipster type of deal and it was so funny looking back and yeah like it, it was it was fun another thing that i found to be a lot of fun would be like when i was there right there was like this guy who's like a sonic cosplayer too now here's the thing right he wasn't really in character at all and like he was like he looked like the quartering if he was dressed up as sonic but like when I was a kid, I didn't care. I just saw Sonic, and I was hyped. Like, I was all like, oh my god, it's Sonic, he's real! Right? And, like, it's just this fat dude with, like, a really gross beard who, like, you know... I, I bet he was probably happy that I was happy, but, like, my parents, you know, they saw that, and they were all like, okay, good. And, like, I never saw that, that picture, like, ever again, because, like, here's the thing, right? My parents save all of the pictures from, like, all, all the stuff that I do, right? But, like, with that one, they just never saved. But I still managed to remember it clearly. And, like, I think I might know why. But at the same time, you can never judge a book by its cover. Like, for all I know, this guy could be doing good deeds every day for everyone out there in the world. And, you know what? That'd be pretty nice to think about. But one moment that stands out to me in particular that I found to be absolutely hilarious would be with this group of Marvel characters that me and my uncle, yeah, my uncle was there during that time too, who we were like interacting with. Like, okay, here's the thing. This is like really funny, right? So like the people who were there who were like the Marvel characters, they were Wolverine, Gamora, and Star-Lord, right? And then my uncle went up to the Gamora cosplayer and asked, who she's supposed to be, right? And then she said, oh, I'm Gamora from Guardians of the Galaxy. And then he said, I'd like to be the Guardian of your galaxy. <laughs> now, this is another thing that I remember, right? And this is like way later on in the future when I'm like already an adult, right? Now, here's the thing. I remember I went to like this beach, right? And like there, you know, the whole thing about marijuana, right? It was, like, completely legalized, recreationally, like, you know? And so, you know, I decided for the very first time ever to try it. And honestly, like, I think that may have been the cause of a lot of intelligence 
rise in my brain. Like, I feel like if I would have never taken a shot of weed, like, ever in my life, I feel like I'd still be in the mindset that lol cows are funny. <laughs> it's so weird to think about, too, because... A lot of Native Americans from way back in the day, right? Like, back before all the colonizers came to America, right? Like, way back then, right? They smoked weed, too. And when they did it, like, oh my god. They did it to, like, get, like, visions and, like, stuff like that, I think. Like, I don't know too much about it. Correct me if I'm wrong if there's, like, any Native American watching my content. Because, like... You know, they're, they're still around, and I'm sure they know more about this than I do, since, you know, I'm not Native American, but eh, whatever. But, like, really think about it. When alcohol was made illegal in the 1920s, right, they decided later on when to legalize it, to legalize that, and tobacco. But they chose not to legalize marijuana, despite it being better than both of those, health-wise, and not only that, but it actually does good for you when it comes to actually, you know, being smarter, because, like, really think about it. When you're high, you think about a lot more stuff than you usually would when you're not. You know what I mean? It's always those men in suits going around dictating what's right when it comes to creation or not, right? But then, like, when the 1960s came around and all the creative minds alike started smoking weed, because let's be honest, everyone back then did it, whether it be Jim Henson, the Beatles, or anyone who came after that, right? Like, people in the creative industry started doing it a whole lot more, and then we got some of, like, the best things of all time from it, whether it be the Let It Be song by the Beatles, or a lot of the really great stuff that were made by Jim Henson. Like, I mean, yeah, this isn't really a 60s related thing from Jim. But, like, I think this goes without saying. The Dark Crystal. It's such a good movie. And not only that, but also Labyrinth, too. Which I would argue is even better than The Dark Crystal. Like, is it any wonder why politicians are so stupid? It's because they've never touched the kush. And yes, it was also during this time, I went into my hotel room again and watched Fooly Cooly. Last time it was JoJo, then it was Fooly Cooly. And it gave me the exact same feeling as when I watched JoJo back then in my hotel room when, like, it was, like, back then, right? But, like, now I feel like those feelings were, like, amplified even further, right? And, like, I don't know, like, this show has such a good combination of beach aesthetics and night aesthetics, and it's throughout the entire show as well, which makes it even better. Now, that was like the second to last time I went to the beach, and I will talk more about my most recent experience with the beach, but what I want to do for a little bit is highlight some pieces of media that have amazing beach aesthetics. We've already talked about JoJo and Fooly Cooly, so, you know, those I feel like could be left out of this segment here, despite those shows being the definitive best beach aesthetics of all time, and night aesthetics too, but there are other pieces of media that have it and manage to make it work as well. I did previously talk about New Super Mario Bros. Wii, and... Yeah, that game does have a beach level, but, like, I wouldn't say that that game is the definitive Mario beach game. No, that would be Super Mario Sunshine. And here's the thing, right? I remember back in the old days of the internet, right? People used to hate this game. And, like, I honestly feel like now that everyone loves this game and talks about it in such high regard alongside Super Mario 64 and Super Mario Galaxy, it made it really hard to find that anyone talked any shit about this game whatsoever back then. The only evidence I have of this happening would be with Brentel Floss's song about Super Mario Sunshine, which 
in all honesty, I'm going to have to say this. The game is good. <laughs> it's a good game. It's really fun. I played it on actual hardware, on the Nintendo Switch, on my emulator, and I love it. It's such a good game. <laughs> like, I don't get the hate for it that it got back then, but I'm sure as hell glad that people have actually lightened up toward the game and actually, like, appreciate it for what it is now. Another good example would be Sonic Adventure 1. Now, here's the thing. While I do believe that Sonic Adventure 2 overall is the better game, aesthetically speaking, however, Sonic Adventure 1 is way better. While, yes, Sonic Adventure 2 does have some amazing aesthetics, especially when it comes to the stuff involving Knuckles and a lot of the stuff in space, at the same time, Sonic Adventure 1 has one thing that Adventure 2 doesn't, and that is beach aesthetics and night aesthetics. Like, yeah, Sonic Adventure 2 may have night aesthetics that are, like, really good, but Sonic Adventure 1 has both. The best two examples I could think of would be Emerald Coast and Twinkle Park, both being my favorite levels in the game. Well, aside from Speed Highway, that one's also really good too. But like, this game is just filled with like, amazing aesthetics. And I feel like they could have really done the same thing with Adventure 2, especially since that was the introduction of Shadow, literally the best Sonic character ever. So, yeah. Actually, looking back on Sonic Adventure 2, there is one level I almost forgot about, right? And it's such a shame that I almost forgot about it, too, because it is such a good level. And it has a beach aesthetic. Well, yes, it may be the only level in the game to have that. At the same time, it does it really well. And that would be Metal Harbor. Yes, this is a prison break. But, at the same time, why is it that the outside of this prison looks so beautiful? Like, what the hell? Like, if you've ever seen, like, a real-life prison by just doing research on the internet, you'd see that they've purposefully made a lot of these look aesthetically disgusting, right? But with this, like... I mean, I guess it makes sense since it's on a tropical island that's mostly made up of jungle. But, like, we don't know. There's something about the way this looks that actually, like, feels inhabitable. Which is really strange to say about a level that literally is about escaping from jail. This one, while not necessarily a uh, example that most people would go for, at the same time, there's something about this that while, yes, it has the aesthetic, at the same time, it has what the beach represents as a whole. And that would be the love box segments of Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker. Hear me out! Alright? Now, yes... This is a mostly comedic part of the game, especially if you're talking about the part with Kaz. But, really keep this in mind. With the whole thing about beaches being like a place of love and peace, it's really no wonder that this would appear in a game called Peace Walker. A game entirely based around the idea of peace like here's the thing people have described this game as like the most japanese metal gear solid has ever gotten to and i feel like that's very intentional you know what i mean and here's the thing seeing the camaraderie of all the characters in this game not only makes the ending of this game more tragic but also makes the next game that follows it in the timeline more tragic, which, if you've been paying attention, is Metal Gear Solid V. And in all honesty, looking back on Metal Gear Solid V alongside Peace Walker, like, this game also has a similar beach aesthetic that Sonic Adventure 2 did with Metal Harbor, but, like, 
only on Mother Base. Like, you're not going to Afghanistan and expecting to see a beautiful beach, no. As far as I'm aware, Afghanistan is landlocked, so they wouldn't have beaches to begin with. And I guess the same thing can be said about Mother Base in Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker as well, since it's literally in the middle of the Caribbean Sea. Like, I'm sorry, but you can't get any more beach than the Caribbean. <laughs> Unless we're talking about Japan. Hell, even the opening of Peace Walker, where Snake comes in on his motorcycle, that I think also has an extremely beautiful beach aesthetic. And it's at night, too, which makes it even better. And you know what? Another game that I think does this beautifully would be Metal Gear Solid 2. And yeah, like, from start to end, you're gonna see water in this game. Whether it be in the tanker incident at the beginning of the game, or the rest of the game going forward, yeah, it's got a beautiful beach aesthetic. But, if I were to pick which one I prefer, it would probably be the one at the tanker incident, since, yeah, it is at night. Alright, here's the thing that I think needs to be brought up that's extremely important too, right? When I was extremely little, I loved Spongebob. I mean, don't get me wrong, I still love the show to, to this day, but, like, at the same time, like... It's those first three seasons and the movie that really seals the deal. And I think it probably has to do with the animation style, especially in the first season. And yeah, I gotta say, it's really, really beautiful to look at. Hell, I'll even go as far as to say that season four is good too, so yeah. More recently, I've been seeing a lot of people redraw the modern seasons in the season one art style and like it's just it blows my mind how people are able to like recreate the exact magic of what made this early art style so good and yet modern nickelodeon just can't even get it right with the new animation style that they have with the show like seriously what the hell happened I did previously mention Steven Universe and how, like, I used to love the show and then, like, there was, like, a period in my life where, like, I started to not like it. And now, more recently, I've started to appreciate it again. And honestly, I think I could see why I loved it to begin with when it was in those early seasons. Hell, not even, like, the early seasons. Even some of the middle seasons were pretty alright, too. And, like, the reason why I think I love the show as much as I did is probably because, well, yeah, it has that beach style. Like, the show literally takes place on a location called Beach City. But then when I think back to even earlier in my childhood, like, around the time I was, like, watching episodes of Spongebob in the early seasons, I would like to think back to another cartoon that I loved as a kid, and that would be Lilo and Stitch. Here's the thing, Disney more recently has been trying to recapture the magic of what made this movie so good with other movies like Frozen and Moana, and like those movies don't really feel as genuine, mainly because a lot of the things that happen in those movies just don't feel as real, like it doesn't feel like it relates to people of the modern day. I mean, yeah, the writing is very modern, but... Where it takes place in its fantasy setting, like, it's really hard to relate with these characters, you know? I mean, yeah, like, there are plenty of times where I could go into a fantasy setting in a piece of media and relate with the characters still. But I feel like it's with the more modern settings and with the more genuine writing of something like Lilo and Stitch that it just feels way more like you know, this could be something that could actually happen in the real world, minus all the alien stuff, but still. And, like, it's just seeing, like, all those watercolor backgrounds that really just blossoms why this show is as beautiful as it is, or movie, or whatever. It, it was both. It was both a TV show and a movie, and 
Admittedly, while the TV show was on a lower budget, it still looked nice. It still looked really, really nice. And I think looking back on this movie, like, it really gives me a lot more appreciation for everything that this has given me. Especially when I did eventually watch Spirited Away as an adult and realized that the same girl who voiced Lilo in Lilo and Stitch also voiced Chihiro in Spirited Away, which honestly blew my mind. He's following us. Just don't look at him. Something that won't die. Something sturdy, you know? Like a lobster. Lilo, you lolo. Well, it didn't blow my mind as much as when I saw Liam Neeson in Ponyo. <laughs> of course, it's all my fault, really. She's become so powerful that she's opened a hole in the fabric of reality. She's too young to understand, and she wouldn't listen to me. She's now a little girl, and she loves a little boy, and the whole world is out of balance. Please, please, remove the human on her, or the planet is doomed. <clears throat> If you are looking for ransom, I can tell you I don't have money. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. Skills I have acquired over a very long career. Skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. If you let my daughter go now, that'll be the end of it. I will not look for you. I will not pursue you. But if you don't, I will look for you. I will find you. And I will kill you. And a matter of fact, now that I am talking about Studio Ghibli, like, yeah, those movies have really beautiful beach aesthetics as well. And a matter of fact, it has more than that. It has just beautiful aesthetics altogether. Whether it is the beach aesthetics, or night aesthetics, or hell, even wood aesthetics, which haven't been seen since the freaking 70s with the Atari 2600. Well, maybe it has, and I just haven't really noticed it with a lot of other pieces of media. And in hearing myself say that, I could realize how someone could be confused by that statement. So, what I am going to specify is, it's about the hardware, not the software. But yeah, I think now we're at a point in the video where I think I should talk about my most recent experience with the beach. So, yeah, during Mother's Day of this year, my dad took my mom out to the beach. And I was there too, right? With my brother, obviously. We were eating brunch on the beach, and like, honestly, seeing all of this, like, it just made me forgive every single mistake that my parents, like, took in the past, right? Like, yeah, neither of them are perfect when it comes to handling situations that are extremely dire. But, like, when it comes to stuff like this, I honestly can't just, you know, ignore the fact that they've done so much for me. Especially when, in this video alone, most of the vacations I mentioned were from them. So, yeah, make of that as what you will. With that being said, as you may know, I have a lot of nostalgia for the beach, and in this video, I decided to talk about it for a little bit. And yeah, I get it. A lot of drama YouTubers hate when people talk about nostalgia, and a lot of nostalgia YouTubers hate it when people talk about drama. So, you know what? I think I'm gonna pick a side. Yes, a good majority of my viewers watch drama-related content, but I don't care. A good majority of my viewers hate me anyway, so I'm gonna have to decide with the nostalgia YouTubers on this one. <laughs> 